Okay, everybody, so hello and welcome. Today is the Conscious Spending Seminar. So for today's seminar, what we are going to be doing is we're going to first go and get into holistic goal setting. This is the real juice that I think is underutilized when it comes to your finances. This is probably more valuable than the rest of the seminar put together. But don't leave once that's over because we're going to go through spending trackers. Again, a tool that I think is really underutilized and really powerful when it comes to going and being conscious of how you spend and ultimately managing your finances. And then we're going to get into budgeting. That's something that you can see a little bit more commonly around the place. So today's session is going to be very practical. I want you guys to sing out. If you've got questions, ask them. I'm going to ask you guys questions as well. And when you see there's the little cup symbol up there, that goes and says that I'm going to be going and asking you guys questions for which there's prizes when you answer. So the prizes that we've got today, we've got two um, people can get free access to our paid course. Um, and as well, we're going to be giving away some coaching sessions with me to help get your finances on track. So if you guys win a prize, Hoy is going to come around and take down your details um, so that we're able to make sure that you get the prize that you're meant to get. So enough ado, let's go on. So traditionally, if you talk to somebody and you say, I want to make more money, what they're going to tell you is, well, you should go to work for longer or you should go and save, you should, you should go and cut down on your costs and this will let you save more money. That's a basic sort of way to look at it. And it's okay advice, but there's a lot more depth and nuance there because otherwise, anytime you wanted to work, make more money, you'd just be working more and more and more and more hours or having to go and become more and more and more frugal. That doesn't actually always work. So instead of doing that sort of approach, I believe what you should do is that you should go and first work out how you should use your resources, your time and your money in a way that reflects your priorities well. Because when you do that, you're going to find that you're spending your money on things that actually really matter to you and your time, your energy. That's where that all, the direction which that's all going to be taking. And ultimately, that's going to go and become, go and help you create a life that is a lot happier. So, holistic goal setting is the first and the most important thing you can do. If you don't know what is important to you, how is spending money going to go and get you towards what is important to you? It's a little bit like throwing a dart at a dartboard with a blindfold on. Sure, if you throw a whole lot of darts, maybe you'll eventually hit the dartboard, but it's a lot more efficient to take the blindfold off and actually try to throw it at the target. So what holistic goal setting does is it takes that blindfold off, so to speak. It goes and helps you actually work out the target and getting you on point. So the first step that you guys need to think about is what areas in life are important to you? So if you were to look at your life as a whole, you want to break it down and say, right, what are the major parts of my life that matter to me? So I'm going to throw a question out to you guys. It's the first of these little cups. Um, I'd like someone to go and name four areas of their life that's important to them, bits of your life that's something that's huge, something that's crucial. Yep. Uh, exercise, family, friends, and work. Nice. Um, Hoy. Hello, Hoy. Do you mind going and taking down his details, please? Yeah. So that's really good. And I think that that aligns actually quite well with the sorts of things that I'm thinking of. So if I'm to break down my life, exercise like your health, your fitness, that is a really key one because if you don't have your health, you don't have anything to build on. If I'm sick and I can't go to work, good luck earning money. So that one is really, really key. The second thing I would talk about is my emotional well-being because if I'm feeling depressed and feeling like rubbish every day, 
good luck going to work, good luck doing anything really. You'll have a life, sure, but your life isn't really worth living at that point. My mind is probably the next key area for me. So if my mind is engaged, I'm learning, I'm enjoying my life, um, I'm thinking every day, that is something that's important because, again, there's a reason why people don't want to work as fruit pickers because it just doesn't engage your mind, it doesn't bring you joy, it doesn't help you learn. So investing into your mind is also, I feel, really important. Your family. So you've got your parents, you've got your family relationships again. Um, they're always going to be there. And again, I think it's really important. And your friends as well. That sort of social element. Because a life that's shared with others, that's a life that helps you build these meaningful connections. Um, going through other areas as well, you might want to go and talk about your career. Because again, if you're not earning money, if you're not going and working in a way that you're creating value for other people, there's a problem. Your finances, that's also important. So I'm rattling off a long list, right? Those are the ones that matter to me. But what you need to work out first is what matters to you. For example, if I'm an atheist, my spiritual life probably isn't going to be quite as important to me compared to if I've got a relationship with God and all of that. So, you know, um, different people, different things will be important. And once you've figured out what areas of your life are important to you, those big, big, big ticket items, you need to work out what your key goals are. Once you've gone and said, okay, well, my fitness is important to me, well, so what? What do I want for my fitness? If I just say my fitness is important to me, but, you know, I, I don't really care whether my shape is round or toned or whatever you want, then you're not going to get anywhere. So putting it out to the room, this isn't a prize question, but, you know, just putting it out to you guys. When you think about your goals, um, things that really matter to you, does anyone want to share some of theirs? Nice. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, that's great. Anyone else got one? Awesome. One of mine, I want to start a family, like I want to have children um, next year, if not sooner. So again, you can imagine different people, different goals. The focus, I can't tell you what your goals should be. I can't tell you what areas of your life are important to you. You need to sit down and really take the time and work this out for yourself. Because once you've sat down and you know what is really the big things in your life? What is it that really matters to you? Then, and you've got these clear goals, and you can then sit down and start feeling your why. You can go, okay, well, I've got this goal to become an Olympic boxer. Why is it so important to me? Is it because, you know, I want to wear the gold medal and that really does it for me? Well, I'm not here to judge um, that that might well be a big enough why for you and really, really be important. It might be the prestige. It, it can be whatever it is. But the more you can attach yourself to that why, that feeling, that emotion, that drive, that's what's going to help you push the, through barriers to actually get you to that goal. So that why is really key. And as a guy, like, let's, let's be real. I'm a guy, I'm often told, like, yeah, you don't really worry about these things called emotions, you know, that they're really just there for girls, yeah, no. Um, even for guys, you've got to really connect with your why or you're going to find you're pretty procrastinating a hell of a lot and you're not really going to make real strides towards that goal. So you need to really get in touch with that why, that it's that Really, it's your emotional battery that's going to drive you towards it. Where this starts to tie into finances and why this is so key is you then start looking at your resources. Well, how many hours do we have in a day? I've got 24. You've got 24. Bill Gates has got 24. 
doesn't matter who you are, you've all got 24 hours and it's up to you how you invest your time. So I can invest my time and I might go to work 12 hours a day. That gives me 12 hours for everything else. That is an investment that'll give me more money, but then I've got less time. I've got more money as a resource to work on my other goals, but then I've got less time. And when you're going through these resources, think about your money that you've got available and think about your time. So if I want to become an Olympic boxer, maybe I'm going to have to invest in special coaching. That's going to cost me money. I might have to go and get a gym membership, money. Um, maybe I'm going to have to put a certain amount of time each day towards it. That's really important because when you say, this is what I've got to do to get me to the goal, this is how much time I'm going to need, this is how much money I'm going to need for the different methods of how to get to the goal, then you can start prioritizing. So say that one of my goals is to start a business, one of my goals is to get married, and one of my goals is to have, um, let's think, one of my goals is to have a close spiritual relationship with God, and another goal is to travel Europe. You're starting to see, I've got a finite pool of time, I've got a finite pool of money, I can't do all of them. So you rank them from top to bottom. And then you're in a position to actually go and make some good life decisions. Take the Olympic boxer goal. Maybe you want to be an Olympic boxer, but maybe you also want to be married before you're 25. And do they align? Do they not? And that's the sort of thinking that's going to really lead you towards being able to invest your money well. How many of you guys, quick show of hands, how many of you guys like to go out with friends? Like to go out with friends, like maybe it's to a cafe, maybe it's to the pub, maybe it's wherever. Yeah, and how many of you guys would often spend money when you go out with friends? Okay, well, that's pretty unanimous there. So for pretty much it's safe to say, right, for all of us, our social life is important. But all of us will be interacting in different ways with our friends, spending different amounts of money doing different things. So let's say that social is really, 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 really important to me. And for me, the best way to connect with friends is to go, I don't know, coffee dates or whatever, whatever you want to call it, uh, five times a week. Then I need to make sure that I put enough money aside for that which is going to take away from my other goals and enough time towards that, which again will take away from my other goals. So what this is really doing, this process, is it's going and forcing you to have an honest conversation with yourself. You've got a lot of things you want to do. These things all take your time. They all take your money. They're all going to take your emotional oomph as well. And you've got to work out what is it that really matters to me and deliberately funnel your resources towards that and what is it what's on the nice to have but it doesn't really matter so much and you've got to pull your resources away from you say i'm an antisocial introvert and i'm spending a hundred bucks a week going and eating out that might be say going out three times maybe that's not actually doing it for me and if i want to be that olympic boxer on my dreams Maybe I should start putting 50 bucks aside and putting it onto my fitness instead every week. So that's a good example of where your thinking will start going because once you've decided on your priorities, it's, you start, it starts becoming a lot clearer that, hey, I've actually got to go and reallocate my resources. So I'm spending my time and I'm spending my money on the stuff that really matters. So the second question I'm going to throw out to you, this is a prize question. I'd like somebody to tell me um, an example of how they are current, what, something that they're currently doing that doesn't align with their goals, like what really matters to you. Yep. Spending too much money on a Nice. So what would you rather spend that money on? Else, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, travel or something a little healthy. Nice. And yeah, travel, like for a lot of people, travel's important. There's a reason why Kiwis are like, we want to go out there, we want to see the world, are we? I think that's, so if we come back to the categories that we're talking about earlier, I think that's really important for intellectual health to get out there, 
see different perspectives. Hoy, would you mind taking down details? Um, so that is really, really awesome. And yeah, this is the sort of thing that the conversation lends itself towards. So an example might be, you might go, well, instead of spending all of this money on a night out, maybe instead I have a shared lunch or a shared dinner sort of thing, invite my friends around. I'm still spending my time, but that's a way that I don't have to spend as much money. And then you go, all right, now that money is freed up for my other goals. So really what the system is doing is it's trying to hold you to account. It's trying to say, well, does this goal really matter to me and matter more than these other goals I have? And if so, you'd better be putting your resources towards it. Really just take your time to feel through this process as well. Yep. Um, okay, so let's say for example, right, you have two goals, and I'll use the example you used before. Like, mm -hmm. say you want to become an Olympic boxer, yep. you also want to be married by 25. Yep. Let's say both of those are non-negotiable. Yep. You really want to achieve both of those in your life. Yep. How do you find compromise? You have got to the next slide already. So, tell you what, we'll jump to the next slide, then we'll come back. So, you've got decisions. So, what you're talking about, right, what we've been talking about so far is how to allocate the resources you've already got. If I've got a pie, I can, and, I've, and say all of you guys want a part of the pie, I might give you a smaller piece, you a bigger piece, sorry, no discrimination, you a medium piece until the whole pie is distributed. But what you've described is, well, what if there isn't enough of the pie to go around? And the answer to that is get a bigger pie. <laughs> then you've got enough pie for everybody. Everyone can eat. So what you've talked about there is a decision that increases your resources. So how much fun would it be to go to your boss and ask for a raise? I've had to do it before several times. It's dreadful really not fun, you feel like absolute rubbish, and it's something that it takes a lot of pushing to really get you to do it. But if you're sitting there saying, well, hey, I don't have enough money to go around, I can't be an Olympic boxer. Sorry, I forgot the other part of the example. Be married, by 25. married by 25, an Olympic boxer. I don't have enough money to do both. Well, then sitting with that discomfort and that feeling that, oh my God, these are so important to me and I can't do them both that's going to give you that push that might get you that much sooner to your boss and ask for that raise. Because ultimately, it's these emotional barriers that stop us from doing these hard things, like going to your boss and asking for a raise. It's saying, I feel scared. I feel like they're going to say no. I feel like it's hard to put myself out there. And getting really clear on your goals and what this is going to actually do for you and why it's important that's what's going to give you that drive to get out there, knock on your boss's door and say, hey, can I have a raise? Maybe they'll say no. That's fine. Because then you'll try another thing that's going to increase your resources. Maybe you get a second job. Maybe you start do, I don't know, um, maybe you go and start a drop shipping business on the side. Whatever it is, right? Um, but the idea behind it is there's always, you can always find ways to increase your resources that you've got. Anyway, on a bit of a ramble, we'll come back to it. But before we close off on holistic goal setting, the next thing you've really got to think about is what happens if it's not just me in this picture. So I'm married. Imagine if I just went and said, right now, I now know what my goals are, guys. I'm going to go and... Uh, spend all the money and my time on the things that really matter to me. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, love. Uh, yep, she's listening to this, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that doesn't work, uh, is the short story. You've got two people in the equation, but at the same time, you're two people, not one person. I recommend doing this exercise first independently because I might have dreams and goals and visions that are different to my partner. But then you've got to come back together and negotiate together. If both of us want to become Olympic boxers, there might not be enough money to go around. I love the Olympic boxer example, by the way. I'm not picking on you, but I will keep coming back to it. It's great. It's a really good one. So then at that point, you've got to sit down and negotiate with each other and work out, well, how are we going to do this? If you want to be an Olympic boxer and I want to be an Olympic boxer, what gives? Either 
One of us might say, all right, well, actually for me, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. I don't really care that much. Or maybe you say, no, nope, we're both keen and we're going to have to do something together to make it happen. So this, I think, starts some really healthy conversations. And I'm not pretending to go down the marriage counselling line uh, in this seminar, but I think that a lot of couples that do get married would really benefit from doing this before they get married is the short story. Um, because it just pulls you together and you work out, well, do we align or do we not? Um, really, really healthy stuff to do. And when done well, it really pulls you together towards a common goal. Because when you're walking through life in the same direction, really beneficial. Anyway, this is a finance seminar rather than a marriage seminar, but your finances do help in that sort of way. So once you've done that sort of negotiation, then you're going to realize, well, putting it bluntly, how much time do I need to achieve these goals? And how much money do I need? If it's going to take me $100,000 a year to achieve these goals, then you're going to have to set some financial goals to go out there and get you that $100,000. So... It is what it is there. Um, and because, of course, your finances are an area of your life as well, creating that money ties right in. So maybe for you, you might have money and you might be talking about how to invest it better. Maybe you're talking about starting something like creating a business. Maybe you're talking about going and um, getting a second job, whatever it is, changing industry. Um, there are always going to be ways to get you there, but sometimes you've got to get creative. So that is what this slide is all about. There's lots of different ways you can actually get out there to achieve your goals. So, so far we've been already talking about decisions that increase the amount of resources you have. They grow the pie. And that analogy that we were using before. If I'm giving, if I'm running out of pie slices to hand around, get a bigger pie. So often, again, this is quite a male thing I've found, uh, we suck at asking for help. And I know it's not only guys, um, it's something, for example, my wife and I, we've been working on together, learning how to actually ask people for help. So I don't have to be the only person growing my pie. If I reach out to a friend and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, can you help me? That's a way to grow your pie. Um, you can get help from others. So take, for example, emotional support. You could go to a friend and say, hey, do you have a moment to listen to me about some of the things that are going on for me right now and get some emotional support from them? There's all sorts of ways that you can increase your resources. Um, money, for example, you could go and it's like for me, I've gone and started this business and I had a problem that I was going and spending a lot of my time and I don't have enough time to go and keep things going at a fast pace. So what I did was I asked for help. I went to AUT and I said, right, um, you guys have got um, people that are doing a Bachelor of Business and to graduate, they need to have an internship. So can I get some help from these people and have an internship for my company so that they can come and work for me um, helps them because they go and pass their degree and they do well. And it helps me because, well, my business has now got more help. And that's the story of how I got some interns to help me out because I actually put my hat out there in the ring and said, hey, can I have some help? And that's hard. That is really one of the hardest things you can do. If you can master asking for help, it's big. So question to the floor, not a prize question, but... Um, what are some of the ways that you guys have asked for help today? It's a hard one. Yeah? Bang on. Nice going. Anybody else? Oh, I sent an email to someone. I sent an email asking a question. Yeah, yeah. Asking a question. You want to go and get a response. Anybody else? Yeah? Nice, good going. That's really good. Yeah, I'm asked a co-worker for advice at work. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yeah. Asking for advice is a great one because you can use the wisdom of other people. So the other thing as well that we've got up here is decreasing resource wastage. So realistically, if I want to become that Olympic boxer, um, 
I could go and do it in a whole lot of ways. I could go and spend a lot of money on this fancy as coach and drop thousands of dollars, or maybe I just get a gym membership, or maybe I watch YouTube videos and do it all at home. As you guys can imagine, uh, some of these methods use more money, some of them use more time, some are efficient, some are inefficient. So if, for example, your goal to getting fit is, I don't know, doing yoga, and your body just isn't built for yoga, and it's not getting you there, Swap, and you're having to just spend so much time on yoga that you're wasting your time, swap it out for something else. Not to just yoga. I do do it. So, um, But the first example I could think of. So anyway, the idea there is if you can get a sense of what is working for you and what isn't, then change up your method for things that aren't working for you so that you're able to go and use your resources better. Take social, because that's something that, again, we're all saying we go out, for, we spend time with friends and we spend money. What have been your best social experiences? And how much money did you have to spend to get that? Does anyone have any examples they want to share? Yeah, most of mine are non-paid, like going to the beach, going for a walk, going for a hike. Mm, beach, walk, hike, all amazing. Does anyone else have some? Sorry? Online, yep. Volunteering, yep, and you get to meet a whole bunch of people. My wife and I have become really keen of doing shared meals in our house. So we invite our friends over for dinner. We bring something, like we make something, they make something, and it ends up that it all goes around quite nicely. But these are all good examples. Like imagine that you were just, you, you thought the only way you can meet people and have fun is go down to the pub or whatever or eat out at a fancy restaurant and you replace it with one of these. You might get the outcome that you're, you might still get the outcome you're looking for, but reduce your spend. So this is a really useful thing to be thinking about. So coming to the next half of the presentation, spending trackers. Now, these are beautiful. These are so, like everyone thinks budgets are awesome and budgets are sexy. No, no, no. Spending trackers, that's where it's at, guys. So a budget, well, at its core, a budget is a goal. It says, I'm going to go and spend this much money on this in a week. Often, if you don't know where you're actually spending your money, your goals are going to be unrealistic. The key to going and making successful goals is to be aware of where you're at. And with money, budgets come after spending trackers. You've got to know where you're spending your money before you can work out what's actually realistic for you and how you can incrementally improve and then set a good budget. So this awareness, that's the goal. That is what we're going for here. So emotionally, it sucks. You, have you ever gone and looked at your bank balance and just seen it's lower than what you thought it was? Like, who raised your hand if you've had that experience? You feel the pain. The pain. It sucks. It re, you, like, you're suffering there. That suffering is what was going to come for you every week with a spending tracker. And that's great. That's great. I'm not, I know I'm not selling you on this, but that suffering is what you want to feel. Because every week it forces you to say, I spent $100 eating out last week. I spent $250 eating out last week. You won't want to see that, but that is healthy for you because that pain is going to drive you to make a change. If you start with the budget and you say, oh, yep, next week I'm going to spend $20 on eating out. Yep, it's going to happen, guys. And then it doesn't. And then you feel shit about yourself because, you know, didn't stick to the budget. And then next week, okay, um, you say it again, I'm going to spend $20. But all that happens is you just feel more and more rubbish that you didn't meet your budget and more and more disillusioned about budgets. But the thing is, if you start off and say, well, turns out I'm spending 250 bucks a week eating out each, each week, then you might say, well, instead of 250, I'm going to spend 230. And then the, when you get down to that level, instead of 230, 210 and you're gonna slowly go down rather than going for something just unrealistic. So that emotional err that you feel like looking at your bank balance and seeing that it's much below what you thought, that is what's gonna drive change and that's painful. That's why you're probably not gonna to want to look at the spending tracker, but that's why you need to. 
So quick show of hands, who's looked at your bank balances within the last week? Okay, that is more people than I thought. So congratulations, it sounds like that you guys are a little more onto it than the regular crowd. So what about, how re so who, who would check it every week at least once? Okay, again, pretty good. Okay, you guys are impressive. You're definitely ready for spending trackers. So, first up, I've got another question again, prize one here. So, why isn't it enough to just look at your bank balance? Why would I need a spending tracker on top of my bank balance? Um, you get more insights into like how you spend and like then you can see like you can make better decisions going into the future. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Um, Hoy, do you mind bringing the bit of paper down, please? So you're bang on. So if I whip out a receipt or something, if I look on my bank balance, you see a whole lot of numbers. It's hard to work out after a bit of time what's been spent where. It's not nicely collated or anything. You'll see countdown, 24 bucks, and then later in the week, uh, some restaurant, 32 bucks. You don't know how much you have spent on food. And are you going to probably sit down with a calculator to work it out? Not so likely. So a spending tracker forces you to do that. So what I'm going to do right now is bring up an example spending tracker for you guys. So here, what I'm going to do after this event is I'm going to circulate the spending tracker around so you guys can fill it in. So what I've done is I've filled it out a little bit and made it as a template. So this is an example. What you do first up is you bring up your bank on one on one side and you bring up the spending tracker on the other and you fill it in. What I've done is I've made categories of expenses that make sense for me. And you want these categories to cover everything. You don't want any missing money that you can't fit it into a category. Make more categories until it works. And you, at the same time, you want these to be meaningful. It's no point splitting hairs about whether I parked at Victoria Street car parking, one category for that. Parking at the railway car park, okay, another category for that. Parking, you, you know what I mean, there's, there's no point at that stage. So it's like here, you'll see that we've got a column for groceries. I had some goals relating to how I ate and the sort of food I ate. So I broke groceries down. I created living food, dried food, animal products, and dead food. So I force myself each week to look at how much money I was spending on fruit and veggies, living food, your dried stuff like your pastas, um, your mung bean, your rice, all of that sort of stuff, um, animal products like your yogurts, that sort of thing, and dead food like the processed crap that you buy. So that was a real eye-opener. I saw I, more than half of my money was going towards dead food. And I couldn't believe it. I was going, no, 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 no. Surely not, surely not. And that sense of, oh my God, what the hell am I doing? That drove a change. And now it's much less, about a quarter maybe, is going towards dead food. And most of that is towards stuff like sauces, which frankly, I'm too lazy to make myself. So I'm quite happy with that. And I've made a real change in my life because of the awareness that this has created. So your finances tie back to the rest of your life because if you make a change in what you're spending your money on, that will make a change in the rest of your life. I think that your finances are so powerful when you want to achieve goals. So back to the spending tracker. So what you do is you, put, you go and you go through your bank account, do this every week because believe me, after a week, I start to forget what random things are actually for and then good luck, it just takes too long doing this. And I make a regular day, so Thursday, today, this is my day, I do my budget. So I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna have to put in my thing, I'm gonna have to put the things in my version of this and out the results will come. So. Better to stick to a single day because if you let that be flexible, you're going to miss it. It will happen because this is not fun to do. So on top of your expenses, you also need to track your income. So if you are earning income, the idea is that you want to work out, well, how much am I spending relative to my income? 
So if you receive, say, 50 bucks from your parents or there's gifts or the IRD was kind enough this year to go and give you, you know, some money back rather than demanding more money, if you do your IR3, then all of this stuff needs to go on here. The goal of these two trackers is to track everything. If you're spending cash, you're going to have to make a note of it because it's going to have to go in later. If you are spending on your credit card, someone else's credit card, well, you're going to have to get that assuming that you pay them back. So this, you need to track everything because if it's not tracked, then it's not going to be accounted for and it's not actually going to be a real spending tracker. So I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So because you can pull a report like that. You you can pull you can pull a report like that. Essentially the reason, the difference between this and the app is I think that this is quite well optimized to go and show you things that are actually going to be useful and splitting it off into the different categories. An app can do the job. And all, in all honesty, I actually want to develop an app that will automatically go on to the different bank websites, pull the stuff out, put it in. I think that there's a real gap in the market, but yeah, ultimately, this can end up being replaced by an app, and I want to do that. I think that's going to be a good way to make some money. Actually, um, I know there's this app that's a computer app. It's called Money Manager DX. And mm -hmm. At least with ASB, what you can do is you can export your bank transactions as like a QIS file or whatever, and you can import it. Mm -hmm. So it is sort of manual, right? but it's like you can do something like that as well. Yeah, something like that's really good. And you just want to make sure you find something that works for you. I have a software development company, so... Could work out well. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should be in touch afterwards. But yeah, it's like in all seriousness, I think that there's a lot of money to be made here because, believe me, I sit down every week and I go, eh, I've got to input these things. And again, if you don't do it every week, it gets worse. So yeah, I think that there's a real, there's a real niche mark. There's a real hole in the market there. And on top of that, don't even get me started on foreign exchange if you want to go overseas. Now, that was a nightmare. But anyway, save that story for another time. So once you've actually gone and put everything in, what will come out is this. So I've done a, essentially this here is a bit of fancy. This is essentially a very fancy formula here, which summarizes the week's expenses in that category and plonks them there on the line. You don't have to worry so much about this. This is a back-end thing because what it gives you, so say that your week, you're looking at the week ending on the 8th of the 6th. Just happened to be when I made this spreadsheet here. So here it summarizes your total income for you. All right, $1,000.50. And then you've got these things called recurring expenses. So the expenses that happen every single week, you just, they're the same, rinse and, rinse and forget them. You don't want to write down every week that I spent 500 on rent. So that just takes care of it for you. And your general expenses, everything else, you can see that there. You can play around with savings as well. So here, what I've done is I've said, all right, I've got different areas of my life, like different goals. You remember the holistic goal setting at the beginning? Uh, Olympic, um, Olympic boxer was one of the things. I might have a savings fund called Olympic Boxing Dream, and I'm putting money into that savings every week, a little bit of money. And every time I make a spend from that money, again, that goes in there. So that's a really fun way to go and actually put your goals into your finances and you can see every week how much money you're putting towards it. I think that's really helpful. So it's like for me in this sample one, health and well-being. So stuff like the doctors, um, if you're going and investing into things like Ayurveda or um, nutritionist information or whatever it is for your health, you're probably going to want to be investing money consistently into that. Um, emergency fund, there's all sorts of different options there that you can do for spending. So not for spending, for the savings accounts that you've got. We're not going to go too much into them. But the cool thing, because you choose your own, but the cool thing is at the end of each week, can you see how we've got this surplus column? What it does is it looks at what you've spent, what you've saved, and it says whether you're in the green or whether you're in the red. 
realistically, if you're in the red, you're going to have to put less money into savings. And if you're really in the red, like you haven't contributed anything into savings, that's when you know I'm on an unsustainable path. I'm spending more than I've got before we even come to savings. You're consuming your savings. Yep. So I think both, you can do both of them at the same time. So what I did, for example, when I was um, a law clerk at Balgully, um, I went and said, OK, I'm, um, I've got a certain amount of income. Say, uh, this is not the amount, but say it's $1,000 a week. It's easy to work with. No way would they pay you that. Um, so then I said, all right, now, while I've got $1,000 a week, let's pretend I've only got $900 a week and budget accordingly. So then I'd always put $100 into savings regardless, and I'd pretend that I had less money than I did. Um, and then within that money as well, again, I'd save some of it too. But the idea is, so you can always choose the percentage that you want to save, but I think it really helps to put a name on it. Physically create a bank account. Like let's say you're saving up to have a child, a baby have a bank account called Baby Fund and put money into it, then you're going to get really motivated to save. Um, ditto with all the other goals. If you're wanting to save for your OE, have a bank account called OE and be contributing money each week. And if you have, say, gone out on the town, spent 250 bucks, you're going to feel the pain when you can't put money into your OE account that week, and that's going to drive the change. Yep. Great question. So it really depends on the goal. So say if I've already got a fair bit of money, a term deposit might make sense if I'm going to go and use, like, access the money soon. Or maybe you might need to go, if it's a longer term goal, it might be better in, say, a shares fund or something like that. Essentially, the, what one you choose is going to depend on the situation, and that's definitely getting, that's more into what we talked about last time um, in the last seminar rather than this one. We'll run out of time, unfortunately. Great question, great topic. But unfortunately, we can't really dip into it. So as well, you're going to be able to look through a whole bunch of different things here with monthly spends, for example. You can go and break down the figures per month. Um, you might want to go and have a tab like this where you can see how much is in your savings accounts. But realistically, if your bank account matches this, you'll be able to see all the time. And it's easy to check. Because if your money in your account doesn't match the money you see on the screen, there's a problem. Makes it easy, rather than having to muck around. So, it's a short step to go from the spending tracker to a budget. If you give me one moment. So, realistically, this budget that you can make begins with your weekly tracker. So if I can say last week I spent how much? 115 on groceries. That puts me in a position to say, well, next week I'm only going to spend 100. When you're wanting to create your budget, start with your spending tracker. Your spending tracker is the best place to begin with because you're starting in reality. You're starting with the amount you're actually spending. So, quick show of hands, who actually has a spending tracker? Nice, nice. There's a couple. What about a budget? Yep. So there's a few people around. So, for some of you, I guess I'm preaching to the converted, but I think you need to first have a spending tracker and then go for your budget because they work together really well. Once you've got that sense of how much money is actually going out, that's when you can start working out how you want to allocate it. There's a lot of resources out there for budgets, let's be real, but spending trackers are the ones that I think are really underrepresented. That's why we're spending so long on them. So, let's switch this back. So, there's a little bit of a user's guide which I've got here to spending trackers. Essentially, 
This is the sort of stuff we've talked about already. Create a weekly habit. You probably want to do a health check at the end of the month, make sure the numbers actually match. Automate it as much as you can to save your time. Track everything. All of this stuff essentially we've talked about. The one thing I would say is if you've got the Excel spreadsheet, the mother of all Excel spreadsheets like the one I've got, and you start editing things and you're not careful, you could uh, create a few problems. So creating um, ability, pretty much you want to save it and if you're making major changes, create a new copy for whatever, like, or you could lose a whole lot of data. Just be really careful when you're playing around with it, especially if you're not so hot on Excel and don't understand exactly how it works. Um, yeah, I've managed to kill a spending tracker before and it was painful, don't do it. Um, essentially, the best sort of approach, if you remember how we had, so I'll actually bring this one back up again. Did you say you were going to email us those Yeah, so again, I hope you guys have put your email addresses out at the, um, I think with Stuart when he was going and taking down your names, because that's how I'm going to get in touch with you guys. So we'll email this out to you guys afterwards. So imagine here, let us delete the savings. So imagine that you are at the end of the week. It is your Thursday, and you, uh, you've, you've just put in your income, you've put in your expenses, and you come to the end of this row here, and you say, great, I've got $274. Then the next step for you guys is to say, well, where do I want to save that money? Each week, I might put $100 into health and fitness. So, all right, I start with that. Each week, I might put $50 into holiday fund. All right, well, that's easy. And each week, I might put $100 into the house deposit. Okay, now I've got $24.07 left to work with. Where do I want to allocate that? All right, maybe I put a little more into health and fitness. I know I've got a doctor's visit coming up. And, oh, $14, all right, I know that um, parents' birthday is coming up in a month or so, maybe I want to put it in there. So that's the sort of thing that just keeps you thinking all the time about, well, what's coming up? What's important to me? What matters? And it helps you keep on top of your priorities. So this is the little exercise that I quite often do. Essentially, you can get a lot out of your spending tracker. So, so far we've been talking about, well, overall, am I spending more than I earn? Am I earning more than I spend? And you can work out how your spend is your spending and whether this aligns well with your goals. You can also look at trends. So something my wife and I have been really fascinated by is that the amount of money we've spent on things have changed over time. And then we start asking why. So, Again, throw it out to you guys. What have you guys noticed? Have you guys noticed any interesting changes and trends for the amount of money you've spent on things? Yeah? Yeah, groceries. Amazing. And then what you've done there is you've you've gone to the next step. You've got the trend. Hey, I've spent more on groceries. You've identified why, it's the metro and the convenience, and then you're in a position to go, well, do I value the convenience more and the time it saves me, or do I value the money more? And again, maybe you value the convenience more, and that's okay. Maybe you value the money more and you need to make a change. But it makes you aware, and once you see it, you can't unsee it, and that's really annoying. It creates that pain. Same thing, groceries. Mm. Nice going, yeah. Yeah. Right, say for example, you really want to save the money, but you like you also love the convenience. Right? How do you stay dedicated to saving that money? Well, that's the thing. You've got competing priorities, so you've got to go and work out what is more important. Maybe you do a halfway house solution. Maybe you do um, a big shop in each week deliberately, and you get most of the things you need. But then you're also open to going and um, shopping every now and then throughout the week as well to get those little sorts of items. So you get creative. Um, Maybe you might find that you do a big shop at, say, the Indian store because you bulk buy a lot of nuts 
um, a lot of those like flowers, lentils that are way cheaper there. And then you just use the regular supermarket for your processed food. Um, and you treat that as your convenience. Pretty much just try things and see what happens. And just some other question, like, like let's say you want to go on holiday or, or something and, mm. and you try and do things on a budget or on cheap, but that might like cramp your style. So how do you mm. like save money without cramping your style? Yeah, so what you do there is before you go on the holiday, try to estimate how, well, how much money am I going to want? And what I recommend doing is once you've gone through and said, right, I think I'm going to spend 2500 on this holiday, add an extra 15%, and that's your, that's your saving goal. Maybe it's 15% for you, maybe it's 20 maybe it's 10 If you're really good at estimating, say 10 If you're not so good, maybe say 20 That will give you just a bit of leeway for when things go wrong and they don't go to plan, and then your style won't be cramped. And once you know, say... Say I've got a holiday, it is 50 weeks away and the number is 2,500. Well, 2,500 divided by 50, bad idea to do maths there, but I think that comes to $50 a week. I think. Yeah. Yes. So maths successful. But then you know that you've got to be saving that each week. And then if you look at your finances each week and you go, I don't have $50 to save each week, then you go, well, what's more important to me? My holiday and not having my style cramped or dot, 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 you start looking at where you are spending that money. And the sooner you do that, the sooner you can make the change. If I, 50 weeks out from my holiday, make a change, I can get to that total. Whereas if I did it five weeks out or 10 weeks out, not a hope. Not a hope. And you'd have to change so much more. So that's where being on top of your spending through a spending tracker and doing that consistently will really help you. It just gives you that early warning as well. Great question. So, uh, cramping your style, it's like, <sighs> yeah. Or backpackers that really cramp your style. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much. The long story short, what I'm saying, spending trackers, good. They are not, like, people do not emphasize them enough. And I cannot speak highly enough of them because they create the emotional impact that leads to real change. That is, as well, the thing that I think is really missing in a lot of people's discourse around these topics. It's, it's how you feel about things. If you feel it, you'll do something. And, yeah. Before I got married, I thought I was this highly logical, highly intelligent person. <laughs> I wouldn't make emotional decisions. Yeah, I make emotional decisions all the time. It's just a matter of, I just wasn't aware of it then. Now I've got a bit more awareness. But yeah, so it's just really important. The more you understand, the more you can do something about it. It's, that's all. It's not, you don't have to label something as bad as well off the bat. It's like if you go and you see I'm spending $250 a week on eating out. Don't tell yourself you're a terrible person. Don't tell yourself, how could I do this? Just, just start by just accepting, well, this is just what is. This is where I'm at. That's okay. I'm fine. Now, what do I want to do about it? The past is gone, but I can change the future. Yep? It happens a lot when I start tracking, checking the tracker. Because my partner does every month, mm. but he doesn't make an adjustment. And then I start check checking and say, oh, my God, we spent 500 per, per week in groceries, but 500 or so going out. It cannot be there. Mm. You cannot go out every day of the week mm. because we have food at home. So we start making changes. So we go less, like mm. during the week is probably two times. Mm. But those uh, two times that we go, we use some special, mm. like book me or some apps that you can have like 50% off if you go or like different apps like uh, first day or something like that. And we change a lot. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Good example of how that can create success. Yep. Um, I have a question. Okay, so say for example, right, like, I don't know, it's just like speaking hypothetically, but let's say, I don't know, in your spending tracker, you spend, I don't know, $50 a week at the chemist, right? Mm. Now, let's say you need that medicine, though. Mm. How can you go about, like, reducing the cost of that? Or is that when you make the pie bigger, so to speak? Well, you can. If, if it's, say, for example, like, let's say my car breaks down. That's a sort of large expense that if you haven't saved for, you, you, you don't really have an option. You, you can try making the pie bigger that week, but it's probably not going to work. 
What I tend to do in that sort of situation, if it's unavoidable, I make a deficit and then I force myself to pay it back over time. So say I've spent $2,000 this week on an unexpected expense. I don't have an emergency fund because, you know, I haven't prepared. I don't have anything in my car fund because, again, I haven't prepared. It happens sometimes. Like Life, life can do that. Um, then what I'd say is, right, I'm going to save a certain amount of money each week until I hit that $2,000. And typically it's not something as big as $2,000. It's something smaller. So I decide when I'm going to get it done by, and it's got to be a manageable amount, and that is the thing that gets prioritised first, because I've already spent that money. That one is a harder one to do, though. It's hard, that one's harder to pull yourself towards. That's like getting towards the more advanced and difficult stuff. But yeah, really great question. The other option you've got is you might try taking money away from another pool. You might say, well, I'm going to have to trim down all of my other pools of savings to... Um, say, well, I, I have, I've already spent this money. So you don't like doing that either, but you might have to. Yeah. That might even be easier. So the last one here, essentially budgets is the final step of the puzzle because this is what actually helps you to make that change in your life. It means that you go from where you are to where you want to be. And looping back, your budget has to relate to your holistic life goals. If you're budgeting to spend more money in areas that will help you achieve your goals, great, that's probably gonna do more for you and make you happier. If you're budgeting to spend less money in areas that aren't so important to you, great, but you've got to pull that back to your life goals. Because otherwise, if you're just saving money for the sake of saving money, um, Sure, it's, it's better than wasting money and being frivolous, but at the same time, when you've got that emotional oomph behind it, that goal behind it, that drive behind it, that's what's really going to go and help pull you towards it. So here, what I'm really interested in, who, this is a prize question, can, you guys, can one of you guys tell me one of the big successes you've had with the budget? Yep. Good one, well done. Boy, do you mind going over? So we're coming to the end of the session pretty much, but to summarize, overall, life goals matter to you because they're the things that give you a push, they drive you. And if you achieve them, they're probably gonna make your life a happier place because they're the things that matter to you guys. So focus more on those life goals and your finances are one of the three key pillars that support those life goals that help you get there, along with your time and your emotions, like your emotional sort of support, and maximizing those resources, helping them go, the, like, go as far as you can. That's what's going to help you get there to your goals and make your life a better place. And spending trackers, they help make that awareness. I if I had to say the one thing in any, in any area of your life that will help you get to where you want to be, it's awareness of where you are. When you understand where you are, that's going to help you the most on where you want to be. It's like, you know those treasure maps where X marks the spot? If you don't know where on the map you are, I don't care if you've got a map with X marking the spot, you're not going to get to where you want to go. You've got to start by pinpointing yourself, I'm here, and then you can work out how you're going to get to where you want to go. A great roadmap and great instructions will not help unless you know where you are. That is so key. Can't say it enough. So essentially, we've come to the end of this session.